Our next student speaker is Ms. Erica Leatherwood, a replication of a study on isotopic ratios of B10 to B11 in sodium borohydride using a PicoSpin 45 megahertz proton NMR instrument. That was the whole speech. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, oh, where's my, yes. So I'm gonna be talking about NMR, which is nuclear magnetic resonance. Um, I'll be talking about what it is, uh, some relevant topics relating to the experiments that we did with an NMR instrument. Uh, I'll be talking about the actual experiments, and then I'll talk about some of our conclusions. Uh, so nuclear magnetic resonance is the process of emitting electromagnetic radio frequency pulses at a sample and receiving re-emitted frequencies. These frequencies are then interpreted to construct usable data that tells us about our sample. This is actually a fairly familiar process. MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, is exactly this, and that's something that most of us are familiar with. MRI takes the data from the re-emitted frequencies and constructs an image to help us see the unseeable. Proton NMR spectroscopy is essentially just MRI on a molecular level. It's looking at the protons of an atom. So proton NMR takes the signals it receives from a sample and plots the intensities on a graph. The intensities and a number of peaks are based on the interactions between hydrogen protons and different isotopes within a molecule. Now, isotopes are just members of the same family of an element that possess different numbers of neutrons. And because of this, they have different nuclear spins. Based on their differing, nu differing nuclear spins, different isotopes create different magnetic fields. And they interact differently with an external magnetic field. So if you expose different isotopes to a magnetic field in an NMR instrument, the intera interactions will produce peaks, like what we see here, with different intensities, which can be predicted using a simple algebra tool called Pascal's triangle. In proton NMR spectroscopy, the peaks produced will be split depending on the number of neighboring protons affecting the hydrogen protons. This process is known as coupling. This coupling will produce singlets, doublets, triplets, etc., and they will appear as distinct peaks on an NMR spectrum, like what I showed you in the previous slide. So, in 2005, Murray Zanger and Guillermo Moina conducted an experiment using a 400 megahertz NMR spectrometer. They attempted to determine the isotopic ratios of boron-10 and boron-11 present in a sample of sodium borohydride. Um, so the instrument that they used was a typical proton NMR spectrometer like this one. It actually, um, this is the instrument that they use taken from the company's website. Um, the instrument that they used it was very large in size and had a very strong magnetic field. A stronger magnetic field is ideal for these types of experiments because it will produce much clearer data. In an instrument such as this, the sample is lowered into the magnet of the instrument in a ventilated NMR tube. So Zanger and Moyna dissolved their sample of sodium borohydride in deuterium oxide. Deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen. We use deuterium in order to not interfere with the frequencies of hydrogen protons in the sample, since proton NMR spectroscopy is looking at the hydrogen. We don't want to add extra hydrogen in there. So deuterium oxide, which is D2O, is just deuterated water. It's water with using a different isotope of hydrogen. So their sample was dissolved in this deuterated water, since sodium borohydride is a solid and NMR spectroscopy studies solutions. Uh, using this sample, they determined the ratios of boron-10 to be 17.89% and boron-11 to be 82.12%. This compares well to the known ratios, which are 19.90% and 80.10% respectively. So they're only off by about 2%. The graph they produce is the plot I showed you earlier. Um, the quartet that we see here is produced by the boron-11 isotope interacting with hydrogen protons. And the septet, the little peaks at the bottom, 
are the result of boron 10 doing the same. Zanger and Moyna integrated the areas under these peaks to determine the ratios, and those ratios showed us how much of boron 10 and boron 11 was present in the sample. So PVCC recently acquired a portable proton NMR instrument called the PicoSpin 45 NMR spectrometer. And it looks like this. Um, what makes this instrument unique is mainly its size. It's significantly smaller than typical NMR instruments. As a result, its magnetic field is much weaker, so the peaks we see on plots are closer together. This can lead to minor problems, which I'll discuss in a minute. Uh, another difference is that the sample is injected directly into the instrument. So that image on the left is actually me putting our sample into the instrument directly. Um, it's within a chamber inside it. So this semester, Dr. Scott Massey and I attempted to recreate the isotopic ratio data of Zanger and Moyna's experiment using this NMR instrument that belongs to PVCC. Since the sample is injected directly into the instrument, we ran into some problems with the decomposition of sodium borohydride in water. Um, sodium borohydride decomposes according to these equations. Um, again, D is just deuterium, an isotope of hydrogen, so anytime you see D, it's, just think of it as H. Um, this decomposition produces hydrogen gas. This builds up pressure fairly rapidly and can cause damage to the inside of the instrument. So to counter this and attempt to stabilize our solution, we dissolved our sodium, bar, our sodium borohydride in 10% sodium deuteroxide, which is just sodium hydroxide. Again, it's deuterated. Um, Again, we used uh, this deuterated solvent to avoid interfering with the hydrogen signals. So sodium deuteroxide, a strongly basic solvent, decomposes much less rapidly. We measured the pressure produced from the decomposition over 40 minutes and plotted the results. The blue dots indicate the increasing pressure with respect to time in minutes of sodium borohydride dissolved in water. So you can see it's increasing really rapidly. We actually had to stop the experiment after about 20 minutes because the pressure was building up so much that it, we were concerned that it would not remain contained. Um, the red dots are the same experiment in the NaOD, sodium deuteroxide solution. So you can see it's significantly less rapid. Um, this experiment proved that the sodium deuteroxide would be an effective solvent and we would be able to leave the solution in our instrument for the duration of the experiment without causing any damage. Thus, we were able to obtain this data. So this is what, this is what our data looked like when we put it in our instrument. Um, now we've run into the problem I mentioned before. Because the PicoSpin 45 has such a comparatively weak magnetic field, we lose a lot of clarity in our data. You can still see that 11B quartet really clearly, but what happened to our septet? We have a, a small peak off to the side on the left. That's just due to water. Um, so that's just slight water contamination. But then we have three little peaks in the middle. So we're only seeing three from our septet and wondering where the other four went. Well, it seems that our instrument's weak magnetic field uh, resulted in kind of condensing our plot. So the peaks are not distinguished enough, they kind of blended into those middle peaks. Uh, so it appears that our four missing peaks are kind of blended in with those two big boron 11 peaks in the middle. Uh, therefore, we just use the two outer peaks for our boron 11 calculations and the three visible peaks for our boron 10, and that worked out okay. We were able to obtain 11.50% for boron 10 and 88.50% for boron 11. Compared to the known ratios, there's an error of plus or minus 8.40%. This error is significant. It may be that there are settings that can be adjusted in future research in order to obtain more accurate data. For now, we can conclude that it is possible to get similar data using the PicoSpin 45, um, but we'll just have to expect some error since the magnet is so small. And that's reasonable. When you want accuracy, the bigger the better makes sense. Um, all right. So we were able to get some value inf valuable information from these experiments anyway. 
We were able to verify that sodium borohydride can be effectively stabilized in a strongly basic solution. We were also able to show that the PicoSpin45 can produce data with many of the same features as that of a typical NMR instrument, though the resolution will be lacking. Um, the future research, can, uh, future research can be done to try and optimize the settings on the PicoSpin45, but in general it's reasonable to choose a bigger instrument if accuracy is what you're looking for. Um, I'd also like to quickly acknowledge PBCC's staff, staff and lab techs who made these experiments possible. Um, do you, at this time, I'll take any questions if you have any. Don't be shy. Yes? The price difference. That is an excellent question. <laughs> I actually don't know. Um, that might be huh? a factor of 10, says Dr. Massey. Um, yeah, I, it, it is significant because this is a significantly weaker instrument. So um, we actually have a, is it 60 megahertz that we have? We have a 60 megahertz instrument here at PBCC already, and that's one of kind of the big ones that stays in place. This portable one will be moving up to Black Mountain. Um, but, I, yeah, I'd imagine that it's, it's within a community college's price range. <laughs> um, anything, thank you for that question. Anything else? Yes? Yeah, we just got it in the fall, right? Is that in the fall? We obtained the instrument in the fall? Or like summer? Okay, we got it, so we got it about two years ago, yeah. Thank you. All right, anything else? Going once, going twice, no more? All right, thank you so much for your questions. Thank you.